Hmm. Well, I think that the goal is to bring visibility to MIT first and foremost, and to um, bring together the former students and the faculty and staff here to celebrate MIT's great history and, uh, and to think about our future. So I was born in West Point, New York, and I grew up in a small town called Barry in Vermont. Um, I have one sister and one brother, and um, I, we lived in Barrie up until the time I went off to college. And um, both my siblings and I, all of us, went to the University of Vermont as undergrads. Well, interestingly enough, there's um, not the usual things to point to. Um, but I guess I, in my case, both of my parents, probably daily, um, said things like, you can do whatever you want if you're willing to work hard. And that just sort of stuck. And um, I think what I did was I sort of followed my interests and worked hard at them. And I liked math uh, when I was in school a lot. And that's how I followed that path of math and, and then engineering. Uh, because, well, there were a few reasons. One, of course, it was known. I grew up in Vermont. Um, and I think it was maybe more why I didn't pick other places that's relevant. Um, my sister is one year older than I am. My brother's one year younger. So my parents had three of us in college at the same time. And so for financial reasons, primarily, I ended up going to the state school in, you know, at home. Well, I guess that came maybe uh, through high school guidance counselors and then again um, in college. When I started at the University of Vermont, I was undecided. So I was, um, I was thinking about being a math major or an engineering major. And uh, I think, again, what drove me uh, to engineering was, in large part, financial considerations. So everybody says, do engineering, you can get a job. And so that was, I think, a big motivation for me to check it out. I mean, what they told me was engineering is about math. So if you love math, you should also love engineering. Did that turn out to be the case? Uh, yes, turned out to be the case. <laughs> but I have to say, I went through a few different engineering uh, disciplines before I found the one that, that matched me. Um, you know, I, I blew up a few ammeters in labs and things like that. But I found that, um, that I actually didn't fit really nicely into any of the traditional disciplines in engineering. Um, I did get my degree in civil engineering, but I was different even as an undergrad in terms of my interests. I already at that time started migrating to operations research which I think is, um, I was attracted to because it melds together math and computer science and engineering problem solving. And I liked the fact that um, it required some creativity to think about how you approach uh, the problems, how you model them with operations research. And I didn't find that element in all of the engineering disciplines, all of the subjects I was taking. I found sometimes they were kind of, here's your problem, here's the approach to solve it, step one, step two, step three, done. And I didn't really like that. I wanted to have more of a, um, an element of uncertainty in it. Like there is perhaps no right answer. Um, so I like that uncertainty and kind of messiness, but I also like the rigor and structure of math. So that's where I found operations research to be something I really enjoyed. You like that modeling. I do. I really like that. Um, so how did you approach the idea of graduate study? Oh, well, that was kind of easy because <laughs> after undergrad, I went to work. And so after um, about a year, maybe less, a year of work, I said, hmm, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. I better go back to graduate school. So um, I worked for a year and a half helping. Um, I was part of uh, Bechtel in Washington, D.C., and they were the construction managers for the Metro at that time. And so I was the 
a planning and scheduling engineer, uh, which was fun, but I didn't see myself spending a career doing that. And so I knew I needed to go to graduate school. Well, it was kind of easy. Again, I, um, I wanted either to come to MIT or go to Stanford or Berkeley. And um, it turned out that I ended up applying only to MIT because um, I was newly married and my husband had a job offer in Boston. And so came here. Um, do you remember when you first came to MIT what your first impressions were? Yeah, there were a number of different impressions. Um, first, um, I remember probably on my first day meeting a student who had just defended his doctoral dissertation. And he was now a PhD, a, prof a doctor. And I remember saying to him, oh, you must be so proud. And he, he said, no, oh, not really. <laughs> And I thought, how can that be? You've just completed a PhD. And so, you know, I think when I entered, I thought, it's amazing, the students who are here and the quality of education one can get. And to actually succeed uh, and complete the degree is, I, I found, really impressive. Um, I guess later on through the years, I learned, yeah, when you live with it every day, it doesn't feel as impressive as maybe when I entered. Um, I also, I, I was amazed in meeting the students who were from all over the world, um, how interesting they were and how smart they were. Um, at times I thought, well, this is kind of a weird place. Uh, when you walk through the basement halls, of course, that's where my office was, at all hours of the day and night, you know, there are people walking around. And so sometimes it does feel a little, you've entered a different world. And that was, um, that was one of my first observations that, that sometimes it could be a bit strange around here. Uh, and then I guess other impressions as, as I went along were the, the, the impression I've had many students of mine tell me since, and that is, I think you've made a mistake. You, uh, you know, I shouldn't have been admitted. And it, it's interesting because I remember feeling that, and so many of my students have said it to me since. And it's part of the process, it seems. You just have to find your way and, you know, regain your confidence. Um, but initially, it can be uh, pretty daunting. Yeah, it felt really different. Uh, you know, I, I, when I took a, an exam at the University of Vermont, I can remember distinctly sitting uh, and being maybe stuck on a problem and thinking, I can get this. If anyone can get this, I can get this. And here, sitting and taking an exam and being stuck on a question, that was not what would come to my mind. <laughs> so it was very different, kind of... Um, the big fish in the little pond versus the opposite effect. Um, did you ever think about going somewhere else for your PhD? Um, once I got here? Yes. Um, no. No. Uh, I, I found that the students here provided me this really incredible community. So we would, we would every day sit and work together on problem sets, something that the faculty encourage because they, they know that learning comes by interacting with each other. And I can remember you know, sitting um, and arguing about how to prove something stealing the chalk out of my, you know, friend's hand and say, no, 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 this is how you do it. And they, you know, would come right back and, and we'd have these really exhilarating debates. And it was really fun. And you, I, I just learned so much from, because what you learned usually was 
we often were both right. That you could prove what you were, what we were trying to do, either way. But it, we were both doing it in different ways, and so you learned how to think a little bit differently. Uh, and then sometimes you just learned that you were just wrong, and your fellow students had something to teach you. So, uh, yeah, once I was here, I never thought about um, switching to a different school. So what made you um, focus first on transportation? Um, I think my focus on transportation was something that was um, started as an undergrad. So. I was in civil and environmental engineering. And as I said, I, some of the subjects I had, maybe in structural engineering, or I don't want to offend anyone, but it just didn't do it for me. I, I didn't find what I was looking for. But when I took transportation subjects, I found that there was the element of, hmm, how does one solve this problem? There is no answer. So there are different ways you can approach it and different trade-offs, and you have to make these design decisions. So I like that element of design. So I first got into that as an undergrad. Then working for Bechtel was involved more in transportation systems. And so it was kind of a natural thing to follow up on here. So you sort of drift to the more complex? Yeah, I like, I like things that don't have a right or wrong answer. But I, I also like things that are amenable to rigorous structured mathematics. So it's kind of, a, <laughs> there's a dichotomy there. Um, but I like putting them together. Yeah, um, and the same one in particular has followed me through my career. So um, one of the faculty that I met quite early on here um, it was Professor Amadeo Odoni, and uh, he gave me wonderful advice as a student and encouragement. He was the editor-in-chief of Transportation Science, the journal that is kind of the premier journal in, in my field. And so he helped tremendously uh, with my how to write papers, how to get them through the review process. And then when I uh, joined the faculty, or faculty here at MIT, I was uh, actually assigned a mentor, uh, or they were in the process of assigning me a mentor. And I asked if I could instead have Amadeo Odoni. And so they said, of course. And he's just been amazing. He's, uh, he's an incredibly insightful, uh, dedicated man, and uh, he's, it's been really wonderful to have him to turn to for advice. In, in what ways do you think is it important to have a mentor? Um, so yeah, I think mentors serve different roles for different people. Um, so if I step back a little bit, I... Um, when I finished my PhD, I worked for four years as an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. And at Georgia Tech, I, I also had mentors, wonderful mentors, um, many of them actually, <laughs> at least four. Uh, and I remember one of them saying to me one day, I don't know why I keep giving you advice. You never take it. And he was right. I, I'm not good at taking advice, but I do seek advice because I like, I like to hear how, how they think about whatever question I'm pondering. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'll follow it or uh, that I agree, but I like to hear how others would think about it. Uh, so I think that that's how I use mentors. It's more to... Um, Make sure I'm not missing some things as I think about it. Uh, think about whatever it is I'm thinking about. Um, and, then I, and then I make my own decision about what's right for me. Because I, I mean, what I f tell my students um, or junior faculty who I am serving as a mentor, I, I give them my opinion and then I say, but my advice is to ignore most advice you get. 
because I really think that if what you do is follow what's right for others, it, if it's not right for you, it's not going to work. So you really have to sort through that advice and figure out what is, what is it that works for you? Because everybody has different uh, priorities in their life, different things going on in their life. And so different solutions uh, fit for different people. Have, have you found that the advice you've gotten from mentors, um, has it been more useful in the professional world or more useful in the personal side? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I would say, for the most part, uh, definitely professional. But I can point to one person who I think has given me really good advice on the personal side. Now, she isn't um, an official mentor, but she is someone who um, is in a very high-level position in a research lab at IBM, actually, and who has four children. And so she has somehow navigated the waters. She's a few years ahead of me in the process of uh, balancing family with career. And um, I find that in talking to her, she had a personal advice that resonated, where a lot of times personal advice especially didn't quite work for me from others. So how did you wind up getting from Georgia Tech to MIT? Oh, the husband again. So when I finished MIT, um, I took the position at Georgia Tech and uh, you know, it was in their School of Industrial and Systems Engineering. Uh, that is where their operations research faculty are housed. It was, it's an incredible place. It was a great place to go with a fresh PhD. Um, but I went there, uh, and my husband stayed here with his job. So for four years, we commuted. And at one point, we said, well, you know, this won't work long term. Four years already is pretty long. So we put in place a plan. And um, it worked out that I was offered a position here at MIT and came back. Uh, oh, it's quite a bit different being a faculty member here than being a student. I think one of the big differences is the number of things you do. Maybe not how hard you work, but certainly the number of things. So as a student, uh, you take your classes, and then at some point you focus pretty much exclusively on your research. And usually it's one research project. Whereas a faculty member, you have multiple research projects, supervising multiple students, uh, teaching a subject a semester, maybe more, uh, you're involved in committees. You're involved in a number of external activities, maybe like uh, with your professional community. You write proposals. So you have a lot of balls in the air at the same time. And so fundamentally, it's a different set of skills, I think, that you have to call into action to uh, manage your time effectively and, and be successful as a faculty member, um, where those sorts of skills, I think, aren't as critical as a student. Well, you see, a, yeah, you understand much more of the institute as a faculty member than as a student. Um, and I would say you see a lot more and understand a lot more of the institute when you're in an administrative role than as a faculty member. So um, as a student, you interact with your fellow students and the faculty in your program, the faculty teaching your subjects. But that's kind of the extent of it, I think, for the most part, um, unless some students get involved in student government. A faculty member, I think you cast your net a bit broader. Um, you certainly are familiar with the faculty in your department or departments in which you interact. Uh, your department head, and maybe a little your dean. Um, but again, you know, I, it's a broader view of MIT. But 
as a faculty member, you can hold yourself up pretty well and focus on research and not see a lot of the institute, actually. Uh, being in the dean's office, that's one of the things I've really liked, is I now have met many more faculty from all different departments um, and just understand more the breadth of activities at MIT. And I know that I don't know even you know a fraction of what goes on here, but being in the dean's office, I've seen a lot more, and uh, it's it's pretty remarkable. Well, I think the thing that you hear from junior faculty uh, right up through the ranks is that it's hard to understand the scope of activity here to know who's doing what where. Um, people who you can or should engage with because it could help you in your own research. So one of the things I've seen in the dean's office is that you know th there is this broader view of the kinds of activities going on. And if that vantage point could be shared by faculty, then I think it would help them a lot in just doing their job more effectively because they could make connections with other faculty that could lead to really interesting and exciting research. Uh, and I, I think that that's just one of the challenges um, here at MIT to, to connect with people who it would make sense for you to connect with. There's just so much opportunity here. Um, so, I think um, when I first started as an assistant professor, my focus primarily was on developing algorithms. So here's a mathematical model. Figure out a way to harness the computer's power and uh, solve this mathematical model for transportation problems where maybe there are billions and billions of possible decisions that can be taken. Figure out how you can get today or then computing power to solve the problems. So I, I worked a lot on that and, and working just working to find a way to try to address these really large scale problems with the, the optimization theory and computing power that we had. And um, I think that that first step kind of morphed into a second step. Instead of trying to solve given problems, uh, we moved to figuring out how to mathematically state the problem. So what, what I found was that when you take as given a particular problem statement, then somebody else has decided what's important and what it is you're trying to do, what it is, what are your goals in trying to come up with a solution to the problem. But because of limitations in computing power, the decisions made aren't necessarily what I would consider and others to con would consider to be the right ones. So, for example, um, Maybe what somebody was trying to do when they were um, figuring out how to assign their fleet of aircraft to the flights in that airline schedule, they wanted to maximize profit. But when you look at the, the kind of old models of that problem, they don't take into consideration things like things go wrong. There's bad weather that upsets the schedules and imposes delays and then disrupts passengers who are left at the airport or elsewhere for hours on end. And so my research turned more to thinking about what are the components of the problem we want to capture and what are our objectives? And then given that, how do we write this mathematically so that we can use our algorithms, our computers to solve those problems? So it's, in some ways, combining um, the representation of the problem with an understanding of what's solvable and trying to 
advance our capabilities to, to build solutions that are good, in some sense, um, for these complex problems. And then I think um, that trend kind of just continued. So um, I think if you, if I look at what I, how my research has changed, I think that I've begun to focus more and more on issues of, um, well, I guess societal issues. So it might be uh, congestion in our transportation system and the uh, issues that congestion causes in terms of delays and pollution and energy consumption. And now can we reposition how we think about designing and operating these transportation systems with these other objectives in mind that have to do with in, you know, <laughs> not further harming the environment or even improving it, um, with issues in mind of like energy and the, the experience of the traveling public or the passenger. You might be one of the only people on the planet who understands the issues of airline delays. <laughs> well, <laughs> one of the my, great mysteries. My experience is a lot of people <laughs> think they're experts at that, having experienced delays a lot. I, I have found that when I'm on an airplane, and I learned this really early in my career, um, when I'm working on my my research, reading a paper, or correcting, you know, editing one of my students' papers, I cover the, the paper because as soon as either a flight attendant or a fellow passenger sees you're working on airline optimization, you immediately are blamed for all that is wrong with the industry. <laughs> so I have learned never to admit that I, I work on those problems. You keep a low profile exactly. when you travel. <laughs> when you think about your research over the years, what contributions do you feel are the most um, impactful or, or even the most interesting to you? Mm -hmm. well, I think it, it has varied with time. Um, when I worked on algorithms, I was, um, I was really excited about the algorithms we were able to develop that allowed us to solve problems with as I said, many, many billions of decision variables. Um, and to say something about uh, how close to optimal these solutions were. And then I think as I moved to more working on modeling, um, I, I think that I am proud of the work where we put, we put a different focus on things. So for example, I have a, a body of work that, that's actually ongoing that is passenger-centric. And thinking about how you balance the interests of the airlines, which of course you have to, um, they, th their interests have to be protected or they won't be there, um, with those of the passengers. And what's interesting is it's not necessarily a lose for the airline, a win for the passengers. And so that's, um, that's part of the work that I've done that I've been excited about. And, and I think the work that we're just launching in, in um, Singapore now, it's a new project on future urban mobility. And this, I think, also is really exciting work. We have a team of about a dozen faculty from MIT who serve as principal investigators, together with uh, another large group, at least 20 faculty from Singapore and MIT involved in the project. And it's working to think about how do we meet these growing demands for mobility around the world uh, in a way that's sustainable. And there's, I think, really exciting opportunities here. One of the things I've liked best about this project is it is truly interdisciplinary. So we have faculty involved from Sloan School of Management, 
several engineering departments from uh, the School of Architecture and Planning. And they all come together with really different ways of thinking about the problem, very different areas of expertise. And the team, I think most of us on the team didn't know each other before the team was put together. So we have this great opportunity to interact with colleagues who we had before not known and to um, meld these different approaches. So for example, take some of the advances in uh, mobile computing and communications, information technologies, together with the autonomous vehicle, electric vehicle, and optimization and control experts, and think about how we can put these pieces together to try to realize this future urban mobility system. So sim mobility is the platform on which we all kind of hook in. Uh, so as I was saying, these different areas of expertise will actually be integrated in this simu mobility simulation platform. So it will serve as, as a place on which we can perform experiments that are not physical. So we might want to try um, to establish the potential effectiveness or impacts of different technologies or policies first in this sim mobility platform and then, based on the results, try a, a physical experiment in the, um, in the real environment. So that is um, the, the mechanism by which we will be sure to integrate the different activities of the faculty. Well, I think we're going to be getting around differently than we get around today. And I think that's our biggest challenge with our future urban mobility work. What we have to do is much more than create new technologies and be more efficient in our operations of these transportation systems. What we have to do is change the behavior of people. Because we cannot have a system in which each person gets into their vehicle and each person goes where they have to go. Um, and we have to figure out a way where it's people want to take public transportation. People want to ride share. And so there's there, there are different approaches to this and I focus on the want rather than must. You know, there are uh, strategies around um, sort of the stick strategies of, well, we can impose um, different prices, congestion pricing. We can not allow people to drive their car except every other day. There are lots of rules, regulations that could be put in place and, and might have to be put in place. But I I, f I have focused more on the flip side of it. How do we design a system where it's actually more convenient and economical for someone to use public mass transit than their own vehicle? So that's the kind of thing that we're working on. And, and as I said, it, it needs to bring together these different areas of expertise. I think it relies heavily on information, real-time information and communication. I think it relies heavily on a very dynamic, responsive transportation system that can, um, can adjust to the demands, the transportation mobility demands, in real time. And right now, we don't have that. So those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. So, well. So my responsibilities are um, around academic affairs, so that's to just delineate. There's also an associate dean for research, so it's Karen Gleason, and she's in, in charge of kind of all things research. So all things not research are what fall under me. Um, 
The really great thing that I found uh, in the last three years now in this job is there's been an effort when uh, Subra Suresh came in as the new dean three years ago. He launched a number of different strategic planning exercises. And I was involved in, I think, pretty much all of them. And it was really fun. So we looked at a number of different questions um, from things like um, dual faculty appointments to um, team teaching to sort of things that fall under this category of barriers. And the mandate really was to bring down the barriers. So where are there barriers to interdisciplinary, cross-unit interactions, whether in teaching or research, and how do we bring them down? So that's been one of the, the primary things on which I focused. Um, we also uh, looked at undergraduate education. And again, this was a really exciting and fun thing to do, I think. Um, the result is this, this new flexible undergraduate engineering degree that is modeled after um, 2A, the, the degree in uh, mechanical engineering. And it, it was a really interesting process involving a lot of faculty, um, pretty much all department heads in the School of Engineering, thinking about uh, how we meet the future needs education needs for engineers. And uh, the result was the flexible degree. And uh, that was um, a really fun process to go through and I think an important step that was taken. Um, and I think it'll, it'll be something that serves our students really well because it provides our students with the option to follow their passions. It gives them enough flexibility um, I hope, we all hope, so that they can uh, take the sets of classes that best serve their interests um, and at the same time continues to provide MIT's you know, rigor and depth of experience in, in the engineering classrooms. I think, it, it, yes, in part, there are some, there are a number of motivations for this, I guess. Um, what, what we found was that Course 2A, which is a degree that has actually been around for decades, but has been accredited for only about 10 years. Once accredited, what, what Course 2 found was that the 2A degree uh, steadily increased in terms of its enrollment. So much so that, if I remember correctly, something on the order of 40% of the incoming sophomores into mechanical engineering last year chose 2A as their degree option. And why they chose it, I think, is because there are some students who, rather than wanting to be an aeronautical engineer, or a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer, instead perhaps want to have an impact on energy or on uh, development uh, in developing countries or um, transportation. So once you pick a problem area, now to best meet your needs, you, you really should draw from the Institute, not just even the School of Engineering. You should draw from the Institute and its set of course offerings to help you be best positioned uh, in that area. And so that's what the flexible degree is aimed at helping us to do. The idea is that at the core, you have the depth and rigor you would find in the core of any one of our traditional degrees. However, what's different is that there's flexibility provided for the rest of the degree, much of the rest of the degree, 
allowing um, the students to identify these interdisciplinary areas and take subjects um, across disciplines in that area. So a lot of times these area, areas are motivated by important societal problems and it, it reflects how our students and I think students in general are interested in making a difference and in, in, and in addressing these really complicated hard societal problems. Now sometimes the interdisciplinary topics are actually maybe something different like computational engineering that cuts again across disciplines but but isn't specifically aimed at solving some societal problem, perhaps. So we have a mix of students um, who are interested in, in this degree, and we expect that it will be um, increasingly popular as students learn about it and understand that they can still have the MIT rigor and depth, but uh, as well the flexibility. So right now we have a mechanical engineering and aero and astro offering this degree. And we expect uh, additional departments over the next few years to bring that degree online as well. Um, am I correct that you're the first woman in this associate dean hmm. position? Huh. I have never actually thought about that. I so thought I heard that somewhere. It, it could be. I, I don't. I can't think of another woman. Um, of course, Karen is, uh, yes. and so I guess I was appointed a few weeks before she was. <laughs> um, yeah, you might be right. And you've been here 25 years, right? Well, it depends. So uh, uh, as a faculty member, I've been here as old as my daughter, and she turned 18 um, about a few weeks ago. Um, well, it depends what you mean by that. It's so it's an issue I work on a lot. So I, um, in my role as associate dean, chair something called the Faculty Search Chairs Committee. So the idea is to bring the chairs of all the faculty searches uh, together and share best practices around recruitment, well, identification of women and minorities who can apply for our open faculty positions, and then uh, trying to successfully um, identify MIT caliber women and minority faculty and bring them here. So I, in that way, yes, it's um, certainly an issue I spend time on. In terms of my personal experience, uh, it's been really interesting. I feel that I've been on the cusp of change. So when I started at Georgia Tech, I um, attended women faculty meetings that they had for their School of Engineering. And it was interesting because essentially those women faculty meetings were about uh, all the issues and justices that the women faculty were facing. Um, when I came to MIT, I also participated here in women faculty meetings, and I was really struck by how different the women faculty meetings were. Uh, it wasn't about complaining. It was about identifying what we wanted to do and doing it. And there was this attitude that whatever we want to do, we'll get support in doing. All we need to do is identify what it is we want to do, how we're going to do it, why it's important, tell the dean or the provost or the president, and we'd get support. So that was really refreshing to me because at Georgia Tech, I couldn't honestly identify with the issues the women were raising. And here what I, I find that I think some of the, the women more senior to me who have been here longer face something quite different from what I faced. I think when I came, I have found truly um, 
support. I, I, I can't point to an, a gender-related issue. No. I mean, I found, I, I remember when I first started here that I was sometimes surprised because I remember once I was standing in line at a faculty meeting getting my lunch, and um, one of the very senior faculty um, was behind me, and he started talking to me about how do you, you know, how are you doing with balancing work with, I had, when I started here, I had a newborn um, with your child, or, and, you know, how are you finding, he asked me all sorts of questions, like, um, what do you do with this, aren't you kind of tired, and I was just surprised that he was, it seemed relating to my life, because he, he was very senior, and I thought, surely he's not experiencing the same thing, and probably didn't experience it. And then he said, yeah, you know, I have a daughter your age, and she's a professional, and she has a young child, and it's really hard. And so what I found was that many of the senior faculty were some of the most sympathetic and supportive, because they, they, were, they could relate. It turns out they could relate because they were seeing it through the lives of their children, but nonetheless, they understood. So that was interesting. I can't tell Other you things. how many times my male colleagues had said to me, I don't know how you do it all. And I, I remember thinking, well, not that big a deal. <laughs> I mean, it's not easy, but I was surprised always by that comment, and I heard it a lot. Oh, of course, you know, it's, it's, I certainly, you know, I get asked this a lot by my students, by junior faculty. It is, it's impossible to give advice of what is the right thing to do. I think uh, probably most of us always feel you don't quite right, you have quite right the balance. But, you know, I found that that's true with everyone. When I talk to my friends who are stay-at-home moms or working part-time, it, it's very hard to find the right balance no matter what you're doing. There are only so many hours in the day. And so, you know, there are certain, I think, strategies that have worked for me uh, that help. And partly, I think, the strategy, one strategy that has helped me a lot is to be as disciplined about family time and leisure time as about work time. So, you know, I, when my, our kids were younger, um, they ski raced. So that mean, meant we would go to Vermont every weekend for our ski races. And I remember at one point saying to my husband, this leisure is going to kill me. Because being away all weekend, no laundry gets done, no grocery shopping. We had a wonderful time, though, skiing, and that will always be part of our family experience. But, it, you know, I, I had to say, oh, no, the weekend, we are going skiing, and I'm not doing some of the other things that certainly probably could have been done or should have been done. Yeah, you pay so. for it one way or the other. And you pay for it. And the... Um, I think the solution is it's your private time that gets sacrificed. Yeah, that's that's typically what. Well, certainly your private time, <laughs> that kind of came lowest on the um, totem pole. But you know, if you love what you do for work, it kind of fits as your <laughs> private time, your time for yourself. Um, so that that's helpful anyway. Uh, <sighs> Yeah, I, I mean, I I think that the goals that I've I've been working on are the goals I'll continue to work on. So they're they're about figuring out how we ensure that this interdisciplinary activity uh, can thrive here at MIT. And I think there's still work to be done, especially on the education side, with that. Um, I'm, I'm also interested in, in this topic we've been discussing. You know, I think that being a faculty member um, 
it's it, I, I think it gets harder and harder in some ways you know the um the bar just goes up and up the expectations are ever increasing and so i think making sure that faculty women men uh, can have a life and succeed at MIT it's it's something to think about what we, we've talked about flexibility for our students and providing that to them how you know I think we have to think about that for our faculty too to ensure that that we get the most creative the most enthusiastic and brilliant people here because it's a great job to have rather than it's a job that a few people can manage because it matches their lifestyle. Well, a big difficulty are it's the numbers, little small numbers of people um, who are women. And well, of course, there are a lot of women, but women in minorities who um, are MIT caliber. And from that small pool, there's intense intense competition for them. Uh, so th that's part of the issue. And I think we've done some pretty creative things to help us in that uh, arena. So uh, we've been tried to be very proactive to identify these people. And then we've also tried to be very flexible from the, from the dean side of it in terms of uh, having slots available from the deans, from the provost, from the president side, having slots available when such people are identified, even if they don't match exactly the area of the current search. So th that strategy, I think, has been very effective. But I think there are more ideas and more work to be done, surely. So um, I think that was started when my second daughter was born. And uh, so it was the collection of my students in my research group, as well as some additional students who were interested in the research. And what we would do is get together uh, regularly and share research talks. You know, we, would, we would discuss what project we were working on, what challenge we were facing uh, what new approach worked or didn't work. We would just share uh, with each other and what we were working on and, and get advice and experience um, from the members of the group. And uh, why I, 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 what I remember about this group and its formation was because my daughter had just been born, um, I wasn't coming into MIT every day for the day. So I said, how about if the group comes to me? So we had uh, set up my older daughters, you know, the like plastic big easels that kids used to have. <laughs> and that was our board. And we met in my dining room. And I remember we had cappuccinos and muffins. And um, the students all came out to my house weekly for a while. And I think it... I loved it. My kids, I think, um, baby had no idea what was going on, but my older daughter thought it was kind of interesting having all these um, students around. And I think it was a good break for my students to get away from MIT and, and spend a little bit of time uh, out at my house. So um, as co-director for the Center for Transportation and Logistics, I shared the job with uh, Yossi Sheffi, who was the other co-director. And my focus was primarily on the education side of things. So um, the Center for Transportation and Logistics was affiliated with two graduate degrees, a Master of Science in Transportation and a PhD in Transportation. Now they have another degree, a uh, Master's uh, in Logistics. But at that time, there were two degrees, and they were interdisciplinary degrees. So from the start, I have been involved in maybe what is um, somewhat atypical here, but increasingly common, and that is degrees that have, they don't have a particular department as their home. They are 
um, standalone degrees that draw on subjects and faculty from many different departments across the Institute. So I worked on um, curriculum design development for the, we did a revamp of the Master of Science in Transportation. And I also worked on uh, sort of strategy for the PhD in transportation. Ah, it's a lot of fun. The students are, well, they're brilliant. And they're uh, usually pretty open and vocal and interactive. So it's always a lot of fun uh, to teach MIT students. I, I, I think every time I teach, um, a class, I'm amazed by some of the comments or questions that come because they just reflect how quickly our students absorb things and how smart they are. So, you know, what's not, what's not to like? Have you had the experience of a question coming up that you didn't know the answer to? Oh, sure. So, I mean, <laughs> you learn really quickly. You uh, do not bluff. <laughs> you say, huh, that's a really good question. Haven't thought about that. Um, and sometimes we'll have a discussion about it. And by talking about it, uh, a combination of the students and I might come to the answer. Or maybe we say, hmm, have no idea. We'll have to research that and find the answer. So I have actually served as co-director of the Operations Research Center twice. Uh, I stepped down, I guess, in January of this year because it was a little bit much with work in the dean's office and also the new transportation at MIT initiative. Um, the Operations Research Center for me is kind of home because it is um, the center that is responsible for the master's and PhD in operations research. And uh, it is the center that brings together the faculty across the institute who do operations research. And it's, um, it, it's always been a really special place for me, both as a student and as a faculty member. The um, students are amazing and the faculty are great to work with. So I, I've really enjoyed um, being affiliated with the center and also serving as co-director. The, the um, collaboration interdisciplinary activities are really on two fronts, both in research and in education. So the the premise of these centers, um, both CTL, Center for Transportation and Logistics, and the Operations Research Center. These are degree granting uh, units, uh, and they are interdepartmental degrees. So the idea is that students graduating from these, getting these degrees, um, by their very nature, are taking subjects that span different disciplines. And, you know, I think that the fact that we've organized operations research and transportation in this way at MIT has been a huge strength for us. So when we compete for students, we compete with top-rate programs. But we have an edge, I think, in that we're structured in the way we are. We're structured recognizing that these are interdepartmental, interdisciplinary programs. So a student coming in to say operations research, if they happen to have an interest in data mining for cancer research, the operations research center can meet that interest because our faculty our affiliated faculty, it's a dynamic group. If we need someone with expertise in data mining or expertise in biology, we have the institute to draw from. Whereas other programs at other universities, 
they're departmentally based. And the set of faculty affiliated with a department is much less fluid and dynamic. So interdisciplinary is kind of the hallmark of, of these educational programs, but, but also the research, because all of our students are doing theses. And so their research, again, draws from faculty from across the institute.